Well, Dr. Lakhanpal, thank you very much for taking the time today to educate your patients. I will start off with a very, very basic question that I'm sure a lot of your patients want to know. How did you first get interested in the field of pelvic pain, pelvic congestion? Um, it all started when I joined the Center for Vascular Medicine. Prior to that, I was a coronary interventionist, meaning I was putting stents in the heart and doing some uh, general cardiology. But when I joined Center for Vascular Medicine, this was the specialization in which uh, the center was dealing with. They were treating a lot of pelvic congestion patients with uh, iliac vein stenting and uh, embolization of the ovarian and the periuterine veins. And uh, I got introduced into this uh, at that time. And over a period of time, when I saw the results uh, and the outcomes and the gratification which these patients had when we had given them their lives back, it, you know, it put my interest even more. And uh, here I am. So as one of the world's experts in treating this disorder, you've clearly done more than anybody else uh, in, in the world, at least that we can know of from the data out there. How is your approach to this disease different than what you normally see? In, uh, let's say if a patient seeks this care from somebody who does two or three patients a year versus comes to you, how is your approach different? So, you know, it's all about the clinical presentation of the patient. So you have to sit down and actually talk to the patient, go over all the symptoms. And I did a lot of uh, uh, what do you call research as well as a lot of uh, looking up the literature and trying to figure out what actually other people are doing which is not really helping these patients and what we can do and what we've been doing which is actually helping these patients and uh, um, I would just say that you know Dr. Raju is probably the the gentleman or the physician who's actually done most of these procedures I have done a, quite a bit of these in the non-thrombotic uh, uh, world but uh, post-thrombotic patients and the combined patients I think Dr. Raju is the one who has done most procedures just to you know it's a disclaimer so but you know it's basically uh, trying to uh, tease out what the patients uh, presenting complaints are and if they actually match up with what we've been treating and what we think what we think would be the uh, basic pathophysiology which is uh, causing these issues with the patient and and of course uh, it's all backed by a very good ultrasound a trans abdominal and a trans pelvic ultrasound which we've perfected now with our technicians uh, being able to give us very accurate uh, assessment of what's going on in the patient's deep venous system um, and putting everything together and seeing a lot, a number of patients, you know, more and more patients that we see, more and more uh, symptoms and, and uh, some of them are very atypical we find in these patients and, and once we see them for follow-ups, we assess and uh, see how much of that has improved in these different uh, patient presentations. And when you put it all together and apply it to every patient who comes in, it gives you an edge um, over people who see two or three patients a month versus us seeing hundreds of patients every month. So you mentioned it all starts from the cl clinical symptoms. So for somebody out there who is looking at your video, what are the key clinical symptoms? If they have them, they should seek care from somebody like yourself? So, you know, it, this this condition is seen more commonly in the premenopausal uh, multi-paris females, meaning that patients who are still undergoing their cycle and they have had multiple pregnancies, two or more pregnancies have been, uh, we've seen in our practice identified as one of the risk factors, but we also have patients who have had none, no pregnancies at all and who suffer from this condition too. Uh, and also older patients, you know, who have undergone menopause. So. Uh, First of all, we always recommend that the patients undergo uh, the routine gynecologic evaluation to make sure that they do not have any gynecologic issues underlying which are contributing to these conditions of pelvic chronic pelvic pain. That includes ovarian cysts, ovarian fibro, you know, uterine fibroids, ad adenomyosis, uh, endometriosis, um, uh, it's not, uh, any other pelvic pathologies. I mean, there's a lot of organs and, and uh, tissues which sit in the pelvic cavity, musculoskeletal, is it, uh, you know, is it uh, nerve related? Is it sciatica? Is it something wrong with your gut or your colon? So all of those issues have to be uh, looked at and settled down 
or address before uh, we start considering the vascular causes of pelvic pain, which is about 10 to 15 percent of the presentation. And uh, so if you have chronic pelvic pain lasting more than six months, more with dependency, meaning you get up first thing in the morning, you feel better. But as the day progresses, uh, because of uh, sitting or standing for prolonged periods of time, you start having a lot of pressure in the pelvic area. Some people say, you know, describe it as a baby which has never delivered that kind of heaviness in the pelvic area. And of course, people have had multiple pregnancies. If they have dilated veins in their labial area, in their vaginal area, if they have uh, uh, pain during or after intercourse, especially if they are premenopausal, that that means that they've not, they still get their cycle and they're in that age group, but they have a lot of pain during or after intercourse. Uh, that is very, very specific for uh, people who have pelvic congestion syndrome. So those are some of the and of course, dysmenorrhea, but it, dysmenorrhea meaning painful uh, cycle, but it can be due to other hormonal causes too. But so those are some of the uh, uh, pathognomic features of uh, pelvic congestion syndrome, um, which we clinically try to look for and then uh, go from there. So assuming a GYN doctor has already excluded all the conditions you very well explained, what is your approach then? How do you treat these patients? How do you first diagnose this and then how do you treat it? So we have a, an official uh, formal consultation clinically. We go over, we have a template which we've generated with our years of experience treating this uh, condition. Uh, so we go over the template with the patient and of course everybody uh, gets a trans abdominal or a trans pelvic ultrasound. We don't do trans vaginal so it's everything is done from the outside. Uh, and that gives us a preliminary idea of what's going on with the patient's iliac veins. If we, iliac veins are the veins which are the, the main deep veins up in the pelvic cavity, which then join to form the main vein which drains into the heart. And the iliac veins are the ones which get compressed by an overlying arterial structure and the underlying bone. Uh, and that causes uh, the pooling of blood, which it then turn uh, contributes to the symptoms. We also look for any extra veins which have developed in the uh, uterine area. Again, everything is done transabdominally, meaning from the outside. And uh, this gives us a fair idea. And we rule out any other, you know, uh, pathologies like a tumor or a mass, which may, in some patients, can be contributing to the lot of pressure in this pelvic area. And once we've uh, um, seen them clinically and looked at their ultrasound, and we feel that this is a a condition which possibly is contributing to their symptoms. We have a discussion about this procedure called a venogram, and which is a dye-based procedure in which we inject dye into the iliac veins, we inject dye into their uh, ovarian vein and the renal veins, and to see if there's any narrowing of the iliac veins, if there is any uh, reflux in the ovarian veins. Uh, and then we do an ultrasound the vein. It's called an intravascular ultrasound which then cements our findings from the outside. And if there is significant compression of the iliac vein, it is treated by putting in a balloon to stretch the vein out and then deploying a stent, which is a metal scaffold, much like the heart stents, but bigger in size because the vein is bigger in size. And that then props the vein open against the pressure of the artery, which then reestablishes the drainage or outflow of blood from the leg and the pelvic area and help and in turn then uh, helps the patients with their symptoms. And essentially, since this is a lifestyle and a symptom related issue, patients make the decision on their own. Uh, we just present them what the options are. How, how durable is this treatment, Dr. Lakenthal? Well, we've been treating this for since the last uh, eight years now, but there's been data out there uh, from the biggest group in the country or biggest or the group which has done the most number of procedures is uh, Dr. Raju's group. Uh, for almost 20 years now, and the de durability of these stents is very good. Um, when I say durability for these stents, meaning if they have been put in for patients who we treat in majority of the times, which is the compression of the vein without the uh, without evidence of a blood clot inside, those uh, these stents uh, are remaining patent 90 to 95 percent, uh, going up to 10 to 15 years. That's how far we have data now uh, for the patients who have uh, veins which are narrowed because of a previous blood clot. Uh, that patency rate goes down slightly, but it's still really good. It's anywhere from 70 to 80 percent going up to 15 to 20 years. Very nice. Well, thank you very much for all that information and uh, we are sure you have a very busy day. So once again, thank you very much.